Well, there's just standing room at the back. There's plenty of seats up front. Won't charge more for those, apparently, or maybe a little more. So uh, you can sneak in if you... Uh, apparently, there's some um, underground problems, so there will be people streaming in during the day, um, or hopefully this morning. Um, so you might need to get a little cozier. Uh, but uh, welcome. And uh, as you saw sort of the whole contributor list there, just want to sort of say thanks. Thanks to all of you for obviously being here. Um, but even more, thanks to those that have been contributors to the platform. And uh, just a couple of uh, interesting stats. So I think in 2016, if um, Paul's memory serves him right, we had about 10,000 active instances of InfluxDB calling home, saying it. And now, if you didn't know, in March, particular day? No, just in March of 2016. Um, in case you didn't know, when you, when you do run InfluxDB and you don't put it behind a firewall and you don't switch it off, it does tell us that it's actually running. It just gives us a better count than downloads. And um, I think we just went officially uh, just over the 100,000 mark which uh, we see a nice pretty graph of that in Tim's presentation, but uh, man, that, that's amazing. So I thought what I'd do is just see how long you guys have been using InfluxDB. So uh, I know it's cozy and you've just got here, but how about uh, we're gonna do sort of in, you can all stand, just stretch, there we go. <laughs> Cheap marketing trick, get people to stand. <laughs> yep, moan, bit. And, uh, if you've been using it for a year or less, you can sit. Okay, no call, you can't sit. You've been using it longer. Okay, good. Two, uh, one to two years. And uh, two plus years. That's all you guys. Don't sit, because you're doing two plus years. You can't sit down there. So, you know, get, for those of you that are sort of looking, that are standing, uh, obviously thanks, thank you. For those of you sitting, look at the people that are standing and ask them all the tough technical questions. And your neighbors, you can ask all the newbie questions. But have a seat. Thanks a lot. In that sort of time, same time period, we went from the 10,000 to you know, over 100,000 of active influx DB in t um, pinging home. We went from Telegraph of having almost no connectors um, to over 160 connectors developed primarily by you, the community. And so if there's a there's a particular connector that you don't see, um, feel free to contribute, right? I mean, it's, this is what it's about, and obviously feel free as you're sort of chatting here, looking at those things, but it's, it's all about you guys. And so, as we sort of think and, s and sit down and think about uh, influx days, before I sort of d delve into that, a few housekeeping items. If you haven't found out where the loo is, the WC, the toilet, the bathroom, all the same thing, it's just downstairs, the opposite side of where the coffee was. So you coffee here, you fill up, and you go across the hallway um, to find, find the bathroom. Uh, if there's a fire, apparently they'll tell us what to do. I guess is we're gonna go down the, the stairs we just came up. And uh, for all the networking events, they're gonna be where you had coffee this morning. Um, and you can also have a bit of an overflow into where you registered. So all networking is happening there. The whole goal is for you guys to do a lot of networking, so we have a lot of breaks. Uh, it's gonna be a little tight and, and crammed in here. But um, all the networking sort of happens downstairs, just where you were having coffee and where, we, where all the sponsors are. Power, there's some power underneath the, the chairs. I had a look at that. Um, if you're lucky enough and you have power underneath your chair, congratulations. If you're not, there's uh, power strips downstairs as well. But let's think about influx days. And so influx days, this is our third influx day. Um, or maybe it's, yeah, influx, it's kind of a plural of influx days. It's just influx days. We started off in San Francisco and our first one, we went very, um, I sort of say, generic industry topics around things around time series. We didn't have a lot about influx. We had one talk about influx, and we decided to talk a lot more about machine learning and you know, algorithms and, and, and uh, anomaly detection and things like that. And then we did a survey. Survey said you guys wanted more, the audience wanted more influx. So New York, we did the same thing, put a little bit more influx in and added an extra day, a workshop day. Um, and survey said, well, great, workshop day, let's expand the workshop some more and give us some more technical uh, knowledge. So what we've done for this one is jam-packed today with a lot more sessions. Um, obviously, still quite a few breaks, so the sessions are a little shorter, a lot of breaks to do a lot of networking. 
And then we have a full day of you know, basically a three track workshop tomorrow. And for those of you that didn't know about that, it's included in the, the price of admission. So, um, and you know, there's, um, you just go downstairs and stop by the Influx uh, uh, booth. You can just uh, find out any of the prerequisites. For those of you who have already decided to you should have got an email about all the prerequisites. So uh, if you have questions about that, again, just stop by that booth. In terms of numbers, um, we're going to have, according to the fire code here, we're going to have 115 people. We'll have 115 people. There might be more than 230 legs, but it's 115 people. So if you ask, we had 115 people. It might be a, a little squishy. Um, uh, it might be a little bit more than that, but that's, that's sort of a, and I mean, we were a little, no, while putting on this event, I was a little nervous. Uh, going, wow, will we get 115 people here? Should we get a bigger room? Should we get a smaller room? And so, you know, we'll know next year to get a bigger room, I guess, as, uh, you know, we uh, sold out. And so that's, that's again, sort of a, a great thing to do. In terms of a little, you know, advertorial on, on Influx data, we have a local team now. So, Rob, we just want to wave at the back. Rob is um, part of our local team here. And is Dean around? <coughs> Dean is our... Um, so we have, uh, you know, we also have a support team out here, and so you know, if um, basically, I sort of, you know, with, with Rob sort of still waving back there, if you're trying to use up your Q2 budget, he is available to take orders, and he has order forms standing by. But um, the other thing I sort of want to just mention is that we are also expanding uh, quite a bit out here. Um, obviously, with local sales team, uh, we're looking for a, a, a dev rel out here as well. We're sort of, you know, trying to push out sort of on, on the community side there. So, you know, for those of you that sort of have great, uh, a great network and know of anyone that you want to recommend towards a dev role, um, that, that's the end of sort of the, the advertorial. Um, the last thing I'll sort of cover is we made an announcement this morning. Uh, you probably just saw went over the wire about adding logs into the platform. And we, d we did a survey which, um, let me just do a show of hands here. How many people saw our survey did you get so it's going to have some new cool socks? Just a few of you. Okay, well that's interesting because we, we had you know, lots and lots of people wanting free socks. So that's, um, I, you know, we'll uh, see what we can do to get you as part of the survey. But um, I think what was 27% of our survey said uh, people using Influx are ready for logs. And I think what we've done with this release, and Tim's going to cover a lot more of it, is allow us to actually ingest a much a uh, faster way of ingesting logs into the system and allow you to take more of a metrics first approach to logging. So uh, if you had not had a chance, have a look at the announcement um, and then stay tuned for, for, uh, for Tim's talk. But let's go on with the main show. Let's, let, so we're going to bring up uh, Paul as our CTO. And uh, for those of you who don't know Paul, um, obviously he's the founder of the company. But uh, a couple of things that I'd sort of say would, would you probably get from Paul and, and if you sort of talk to him or if you're sitting down and networking with him is he really worries about time to awesome. He worries about you as developers and how to give a better time to awesome. And so I think that's sort of something unique that you find in our platform is this whole focus on time to awesome. Another focus obviously is this developer first. And the, the, the new thing that um, I sort of attribute to Paul and being a marketing guy, you probably won't like this, um, but this whole flux thing to me is how do we make things that were previously impossible possible? So without further ado, Paul, come take the stage. Thank you, Mark. Uh, great. Thank you, everybody, for coming today. Um, my, my talk today is about flux our new language that we're creating. Uh, and I'm calling it uh, a data scripting language. If you want to be more specific, it could be a time series data scripting language, but it's not necessarily strictly scoped to time series data. So the first thing to note is, uh, as for those of you who have been paying attention for about the last like 10 months, uh, this was previously called IFQL. And we've renamed it to Flux uh, for a few reasons. One is, IQL previously, like when I created that name, it stood for Influx Functional Query Language. And the reason we've changed it to Flux is because calling it a query language is actually doing it a disservice because it's more than that. And the other piece is 
it's not necessarily just for influx, which I'll cover as well. So what do I mean by a data scripting language? Um, I, I, I think of this as a different problem set than just a query language. I say data scripting language because I want users to be able to do more than what they would do in a query language, to munge data, to, to work with it in different ways. And the reason why I say data scripting language instead of just scripting language is that we're trying to keep the focus on working with data specifically. So mining intelligence from it, munging it, doing, doing data specific tasks. So it's not, it's not just supposed to be like some general purpose scripting language. The other important thing about this is that we've recently re-licensed it under the MIT license. Initially when we were working on IFQL, we had it under AGPL, and then we decided that we wanted to get this language as broadly adopted as possible, whether people were using it for influx or not. So we figured an MIT license, it's the most liberal thing we, we could do, uh, and hopefully we'll get broader adoption of the language and of the engine. So that covers the language itself, but also the engine implementation in Go. All right, the talk structure is roughly something like this. First, I'll talk about why Flux, why are we doing this? Uh, I'll talk about the design and structure of the language, and then I'll close out with some motivating examples, some things that will hopefully um, convince you that there's a reason for us to be doing this. Now the first question you might be asking is, why not just use SQL? Right, Influx QL today, as it stands, is not SQL. It looks like it, but it's definitely not. So creating a new language, that's a lot of effort. We could actually just put that effort towards making Influx support SQL as a first class citizen. Um, but we decided not to do that. One, I mean, first and foremost is because, in my mind, SQL is tied, very fundamentally tied to the concept of relational algebra, right? And for us, I don't think time series data is necessarily relational. It can be relational, but there are other things about it that aren't strictly relational. Uh, so I think it's really like beyond time series and working with data generally is beyond the scope of just relational algebra. And the truth is, SQL isn't even a pure implementation of the original S, uh, relational algebra paper. So Ed, Edgar Codd wrote this in 1970 and SQL is not like a pure realization of the paper that he wrote. And the other thing is, SQL isn't even the only interpretation of how to do relational algebra. It's not like Edgar, Co Edgar Codd like came down from up on high and handed the world SQL to, to do these things, right? Uh, one of the competing uh, variants back in the day was this language QEL. So Postgres, actually had QEL as its primary query language all the way up until 1994. So the top example here is QEL, the bottom is like the SQL version of it. And as you can see, they're totally different. They don't look anything like each other. Uh, so 94, Postgres switched over to having SQL as the query language, and it wasn't until 96 that they changed the name from what you see on the slide to the name that everybody knows today. Now the rise of SQL was primarily driven by this company, right? In the 1980s, they were pushing SQL forward and everybody who was adopting relational databases or the vast majority of them were adopting Oracle. So basically everybody piled on to SQL to try and like chase what Oracle was doing because they wanted to sell solutions and they're like, okay, don't buy Oracle, you can buy us and we're a drop in replacement. So SQL didn't, it wasn't born a standard, right? The initial implementations were, were born in the late 70s. It wasn't until 1986 that SQL became an ANSI standard, and it's evolved since then. Now, with all of this history, it's built up a lot of inertia, and you might be wondering, okay, well, there's, you know, there's libraries for writing data to these databases and querying. There are uh, BI tools like Tableau and Looker and all these other things. There's a, ton, there's a massive ecosystem built around SQL. So there are advantages to picking that as a language, but there were some severe limitations for us in terms of using it as a language. We wanna be able to add to the language, add new sorts of functionality, uh, and for the changes that we want to make, we found that it was really hard to, to do those additions and have it actually, one, not look like a complete disaster, 
and two, keep the semantics of the language consistent. And ultimately, what we decided is a functional query paradigm, or like a functional paradigm of working with data, I think it matches much more closely to what you want to do with time series data. Now, now that we're at the basis of, okay, we're, we're rethinking this language and we're going to do a functional style, I wanted to basically rethink produ programmer productivity. Because if you're going to create a language or a new, a new thing in software for, that's for developers, I think really the only way it gets adoption is, is, is if you increase programmer productivity with it, right? So a key example I use here is if you think about data scientists, a lot of the time what they do is they'll query a database, they'll pull the data back locally, and they'll work with it in pandas or R or whatever, and then they'll write it back. And to me, that's kind of an anti-pattern. Like ideally, what I want out of a database and a data platform generally is I'd love to be able to push those workloads down into the database. I don't want to have to write query code in one language and then write processing code in another language and whatever, right? So I'd love to be able to just write one script, tell the data platform, and have it execute everything that I need it to do. And because of that, the idea is that a scripting language would be more powerful than a query language. It would allow us to start pushing some of those data science and analysis workloads down into the data platform. And ultimately, I don't want to live in a world where the best way humans could think of to work with data was invented in the 70s. And we can't even like rethink these things from first principles. I honestly, like I just don't want that to be my reality. I refuse. So now that we've said, okay, we're gonna do a functional language, we're not gonna do SQL, why not just use an existing language, right? Why not embed an existing language in the platform and have people work with that? Haskell and Lisp are functional, right? Uh, you could use Lua, but the, the truth is like, none of these languages has gained popularity. They've been around for a long time. Paul Graham and Rich Hickey couldn't make Lisp popular. It's not gonna happen, all right? So honestly, like, those languages are, I think they're designed for experts. And we want something that's more usable. And we also want something that's scoped to this idea of working with data. It doesn't have to be general purpose. And ultimately, we need full control over the language so that we can make changes to it, uh, define new things, and actually optimize it for our use case specifically. So let's talk so about some of the design principles of the language itself. These are, these are things we try to keep as priorities as we try to, when we have like questions that come up and we're like, okay, which way do we wanna go on this decision of language design or implementation? First and foremost, it has to be usable. It has to be optimized for usability. We optimize for programmer happiness, right? If somebody's gonna make an argument that something would be more pure, if it's less usable, then it loses, right? Like Haskell is very, very pure, but I would argue not very usable. Sorry to the Haskell programmers, but the popularity thing. <laughs> but ultimately, like, I want a language that's fun to use. I want people to have fun working with it. And we wanna make everyone a data programmer. Part of this idea is we want a user interface for beginners. A user interface that's like a builder that they can work with the language, right? I, I think the ideal here, the prior art example, is if you think about Visual Basic 6 or Delphi back in the 90s, the, these two tools, I'm dating myself here, um, these two tools made a ton of people programmers that otherwise would not have been programmers. And they were able to create tons of like, you know, hundreds of thousands if not millions of like line of business applications that otherwise wouldn't have been created. Um, you know, like, I think we should be opening programming up to as many people as possible. I don't wanna be part of some elite club. Elitists are jerks, all right? We want to invite everybody to be a programmer and to build this stuff. It needs to be readable. This is one of the things I love about Go, and the, I think it's what, maybe the best strength of Go is that the language is optimized for readability. You read far more code than you ever write, so when you think about these things, like, 
having a new developer come in and read the code, or even you, six months after you wrote the code and be able to understand it, is a really important thing. It needs to be flexible. We want users to be able to add to it, to define their own functions, to do all sorts of things with it. And composable. So that's, they ideally, like users who are working with the language will be able to build up the set of functions and the things they have over time to kind of raise the base of the language up to their problem domain, their application space. Testability is an important thing. And this is, this is like another place where I think functional actually is really wins out, right? When you think about functional programming, you have a function takes an input, it does some sort of work, and then it sends an output. That makes it perfect for unit testing, makes it easy to test. It needs to be contributable. We want community members to be able to add to the language. So Mark had mentioned um, that Telegraph has now over 160 plugins, and the reason, one of the reasons for that, I think, is because we structured the code in Telegraph in such a way that a new, uh, a person who wanted to contribute a new plugin could do so without having to understand the entire Telegraph code base. Now, when you think about a programming language or a query language and query engine, you don't think of those things as something that are easy to contribute to, right? So our goal with the structure of the code within the language itself is we wanna make it easy for outside developers to be able to contribute new functions without having to understand the entire code base of the engine and the language and all that stuff. Finally, we want it to be shareable. We want people to be able to share snippets of code, functions, all this other kind of stuff, because we wanna reduce the amount of duplicated effort that happens in the open source community. All right, so let's look at a couple of beginning examples before we get into more advanced stuff. First, just a couple of screenshots of the user interface we're building around this. This is chronograph. So up here on the left side, you see like a script editor for the code itself, for Flux. And over on the right side is a builder. And the idea is the builder will allow a user to pointy clicky build a, a query, build a thing, and they'll be able to see results there. Or the advanced users will be able to create and edit a script. And you can basically minimize or maximize either of those pieces. The other part is a schema explorer. So I've talked to a number of Graphite users, and uh, basically I think anybody who's using Graphite at this point is using Grafana, uh, and they love Grafana as a dashboarding tool. But surprisingly, some of those people actually still have the Graphite web UI, which if you remember this thing, is, is it's, it's, it's an awesome piece of stuff from like 2004. Uh, but they have it because it has this like tree view schema explorer thing which is great for people who are coming into the system who actually don't know what data exists. So we want that, again, for beginners. Okay, so uh, looking at Flux in the prism of InfluxQL, like Influx 1.x, we'll take a couple of the basically schema parts. So here's basically a function call to show us what measurements we have in the Telegraph database. Obviously, there's a function itself. You can see that we have a named argument and we're passing it a string literal. I'll talk about the other types in a minute. Here's show tag keys from the Telegraph database for the CPU measurement. We can see we have multiple named arguments here that we can pass in. Here's another ver version of show tag keys, which is the same function, but in this case, we're passing it an array of measurements. So we can have the same function, but with slightly different call parameters based on the behavior the user wants. Here's show tag values from the Telegraph database for a specific host. Show field keys for the CPU measurement. Now, all of these show commands that I'm showing you actually aren't built into the language right now. They're examples of what you could create yourself, and we will have some of these primitives built in, but they'll probably be in a separate namespace, uh, which I'll cover. So here's something a little bit more complex. We're grabbing all the data from the Telegraph database, we're scoping it down to the last hour worth of data, and then we're filtering it to the CPU measurement and the usage system field. We can see here that you can put comments into the script. Duration literals are a number, another type that we have. So here it's basically start is a relative time. We have this pipe forward operator 
So for the people who are Elixir programmers in the audience, that will look very familiar. And I've actually seen, I wasn't initially sold on the idea of doing the pipe forward operator, but then I also saw somebody was, uh, had suggested that as a modification to JavaScript. So I thought, okay, it seems to be picking up some, some steam and it seems to be something that people are getting used to. I thought it was very funky, lo funky looking at first, but once I worked with it for, I don't know, a few minutes, I just kind of got over it. <laughs> uh, and then you have anonymous functions, which we're passing in here. Um, so we have a bunch of different operators that are supported in the language. Uh, obviously all the comparison operators and the math operators, and there will be more that actually aren't represented here. Um, these are the different types within the language. Ants, uants, float64, string, duration, time, regex, array, object, function, and a namespace. So looking at the functions, uh, the, way, the way I like to split the functions out, the way I think about them, is I think about three different kinds of functions within the language. The first kind is inputs. These are functions that pull in data for the engine to work with. So from is the one that you've seen already, which is from influxdb, but the idea is we're gonna have other inputs that can pull data from other sources, from Kafka, from a file, from S3, from Prometheus, from MySQL, and we want the community to be able to add input functions for basically anything that they wanna read data from. Ideally, over time, the Flux as, a, as an engine will be able to work with data from any source you could possibly think of. Then you also have outputs. With outputs, it's Flux does something on some data and it sends the data to some other place, right? So two outputs are always two whatever. Two without any qualifier is two influx, but we'll also have two Kafka, that actually already exists, uh, two S3, two Prometheus, again, all those other things. So the idea is Flux as a language will allow you to pull data from some source, do some munging or whatever analysis on it, and pipe it out to wherever you want it to go. Now, obviously when you're working in a query editor, that kind of thing, you're not sending it to anywhere except for back to you, the user. It's an interactive query. And then finally, you have the functions for actually working with the data, right? So inputs, outputs, and functions. Now, I'm not gonna cover all the functions we have in the language. There are a lot of them. There are gonna be even more. These are, a li not all of these are implemented. Many, many of them are, but not all. But the idea is we're gonna have many, many functions in the language. And ultimately what we want is we want Flux and the functions that it provides to be a superset of what Graphite has and of what many other systems have. And again, this is part of that idea of contribution. We want community members to be able to contribute functions that they find useful. I wanna cover the data model. How, how and this is, this is a higher level conceptual idea of what, how the user should think about data. It's not necessarily how it works inside the engine, like the details of what the engine does to optimize the work is something the user shouldn't have to think about. But when you're thinking about working with the language, I think this data model will make it a little bit easier. So we have the, these example series here. We have four different series. Um, I'm representing the measurement as a, as a tag key value pair, right? And the same thing with the field. So we have these four different series, two from memory for host A and B, and two for CPU from host A. And the idea is you have a table of data. A table has columns that look like this, right? And you can see we have a column for each one of those tag key value pairs that we had. And then we have records, which are individual things. Note that we also have a time and a value record, or column, rather. The columns that start with underscores are basically built in system, system columns, right? So underscore measurement, underscore field, underscore time, underscore value. And then finally we have a group key. A group key is what defines the, the, the table itself. And basically you can think of this as like a series key in influx 1.x. And the important thing is if something is in the group key, every record in this table is gonna have the same value for those things. So that's why I said like under the covers we don't actually duplicate all this data. It's, it works in a different way. But as a user you can think of it like this. So the idea is we have a separate table that's created per series that we're working with. So if you have a bunch of series in the database and you query all of them, you're gonna get a separate table per. So here we have 
four separate tables for, for the four different example series that we have represented. And here we just have a couple of records apart. And the way you can think about functions and how they work is you have input tables which get passed to a function which sends out, which does something, and then you get output tables. Uh, so let's take, let's take an example. So we have, we're pulling data from the Telegraph database. One other thing you can see is that we have date time literals built into the language. So that start, that start uh, argument before we had uh, a relative time, which was you know negative one hour, it was a duration. In this, in this case, we're actually passing it an absolute time. So when you're thinking about this, okay, we're, 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 we're taking a range of data, we're filtering it down, and then we're calling sum. The question is, what are we gonna sum on? Well, all of the aggregates have a default, have a columns argument, and their default is underscore value, which just says sum the value column in each of these tables. Okay, so this input here maps to the input tables that I have on the lower left, right, conceptually. Those get sent to sum, and then sum outputs these tables. So what you can see is we have two input tables, two output tables, and each output table has only one record, which represents the sum of the table. And with most of the, with the aggregate functions and many of the functions in the language, there's this end-to-end -end table mapping, where if you have five tables in, you'll get five tables out, right? It's a one-to-one -one mapping of tables. Now, there are some functions which actually modify the number of tables that you get in output. They'll actually take n number of tables and produce more tables, or they'll take n number of tables and collapse them down in, into fewer. Window is one of these functions. So window is a function for splitting up tables based on time. So we're looking at 30 seconds worth of data, which is basically four samples, assuming that we're sampling once every 10 seconds. We're gonna split that into 20 second windows of time. So here's the input again. The input specifies these two separate tables. You can see the four samples each. We're gonna send that to window. And then what we're gonna get is four separate tables, right? Of two records each. So what we've done is we've split those two tables into separate tables of 20 second chunks. So that's the end to end table mapping. The window works to slice tables up based on time. The other thing is when you do this, it will add under the covers a start and a stop column which represent the start and the stop time of the block of, of time that the table describes. And that becomes part of the group key. Group is another one, but it works in the opposite way. It, it collapses tables down. So right here, uh, this key is actually, this should not say partition key, it's actually a new group key. We're updating the, the vocabulary, the words we use to describe these things. But here we're saying group everything by the region. So we have the in two input tables here for, for, the, for the filter that we have. We send it to group and we group on the region. And because we're collapsing it down and there's only one region, what we get is one table out. So it's end to end table mapping where M is going to be equal to the cardinality of the group keys together that are represented in the source data set. So you always group based on columns. So the idea is window and group slice the data in different ways, either vertically or horizontally depending on what you need. So we, I wanna talk a bit now about composability and flexibility. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna tear down this function here, show tag values. Here's another way to call show tag values. Here we're passing it a start time. Now we didn't have to pass it a start time, but we can pass it a start time. Here's what that function definition looks like. We have show tag values, it takes a database, a tag, a start time, a stop time, a predicate. Uh, it pulls a range worth of data and the interesting thing is, what we're doing here is something that you can't do in InfluxQL right now. You can't scope show tag values based on some window of time. We can actually very precisely say, what tag values did we see in this hour two weeks ago? Uh, we pull in the range, we filter by an optional predicate, we get the distinct tags, the tag values, 
we collapse that into one table, and then we say we only want to keep the value column. So you can see that we can actually assign functions to a variable in this example. You see that we have this concept of default arguments. If a default argument is there, it's not required to call the function. We also have the now function, which is the first time we've seen this. This just returns the current time. And we also see that we can pass a function as an argument as well. Uh, and this, this, in this example here, we've gi given it a default value, which is basically to just match everything. So here it is all again, just that whole piece. And here's what it looks like calling it, say, with a predicate, which we didn't have to do. So we're gonna say, show the tag values for the Telegraph database for the tag host, but only match uh, hosts that have Redis. So basically what this is gonna do is it's gonna get us a list of hosts for which we're actually collecting Redis metrics. Another thing that we can do is we can define functions that take inputs. So in that example, we actually didn't have an input function. We wanna define functions that are pipe forwardable. So say we're doing this query here, we're taking the Telegraph database, the last hour, we're filtering, and then we're mapping over the data. So map is a new thing we're encountering here. Map just will map over the records in the table. In this case, we're converting the values to floats, right? So our goal is we wanna convert every value into a float to just make sure we have consistent types. Uh, again, this, this, the call to float may look a little bit funky because normally if you think about casting in a language, you just wrap it. But again, we, we only accept named arguments in the language. There's no breaking out of that paradigm within Flux. So the question is, how do we make this a function? If we just wanted to have like a function that uh, say converted to float, it would look like this. So we have cast a float equals this. And th there you see the pipe forward definition. And the convention that we use within the language is any time something is pipe forwardable, table is the argument name that it uses. So then we just take table, we pipe forward it to map, and then there you see the map implementation that we had before. So this is what it looks like to call it. Again, telegraph database, range, filter, and pipe forward to cast a float. Here is everything all together so you can get a quick look at it. Now, within the language, any pipe forward function can actually use arguments. So it's possible to call a function like this without using the pipe forward operator uh, and just nest everything like this. So essentially, like we made some mutant variant of Lisp, uh, if you like. <laughs> uh, all right, let's talk about some new query functionality that you get out of the language that you basically couldn't get before. Math across measurements. This one has been open since 2015. Yeah, 90 comments on this one. People want it. <laughs> We've wanted to give it to them. We've tried on multiple occasions to actually shoehorn it into InfluxQL, and we're completely unable to. We'll probably have a helper function that makes this a little bit cleaner. But here's what it looks like if you wanted to do it just using the raw language as it exists today. So foo is one measurement that we're pulling from. We assign the variable there. Bar is another one. And then join is the function that allows us to join the data together. So join, we're passing it in two tables. We're saying join it on some, some column called foo bar and, and time. And then we have a function for what to do when you join them together. Right, so in this case, we're just adding the two values together. And then finally, we're yielding the result to the user. So this is the first time we're also seeing yield. Uh, you might notice that time is listed there. What that means is it's possible to join on things other than time within Flux. So again, that's another example of Flux not necessarily being tied specifically to time series. It has a broader scope. Support having requests. Since, two, since January of 2016, 21 comments. This is trivial in the new language. We have the database, we have the filter, the range, we're windowing, we take the mean of that, and then after that we stack on another call to filter. 
So you can have multiple calls to filter after you've done some sort of processing on the language. We can do more after that and do another call to filter. And all of that stuff is super clean. All right, I wanna talk about shareability. This is not stuff that's implemented yet, but hopefully it's coming soon. Uh, imports and namespaces. This is gonna be a first class concept within the language. So uh, say we have a package called math, we import that. And here we're accessing the math namespace to square the values within the, within the tables that are passed to it. The idea is we are gonna have a package manager. We're, we're actually going to have, we're going to host a public repository like Ruby Gems or NPM or one of those other things where you can sign up and you can upload packages to it and download them to it seamlessly like this. So I create my own user account called X and I create some sort of math package there and I can import it like that. So yeah, the idea is we want, we want to make it trivial to share code like this. And you'll also be able to import from GitHub like you do in Go. Same sort of thing. You don't have to use our package manager if you don't want to. You can just have the code, deliver it all over the place, do whatever you want. Well, I wanted to close out with some queries that uh, I think would be difficult, if not impossible, in SQL to kind of highlight like why why I think the functional paradigm is like cleaner for this. Here's an example, now we haven't implemented this function yet, but here's an example of what it would be like to calculate an exponential uh, moving average within the, within the language, right? Again, from range filter, pipe it to exponential moving average, and you've got your result. Uh, I couldn't tell you how to write this query because I actually haven't been a SQL person in quite some time. Uh, I think I've forgotten most of the SQL that I used to know. So I did a search and I found something on Stack Overflow and this was an example of how to calculate a rolling average in SQL. I don't know what this looks like to you, but to me it looks like a nightmare. <laughs> you basically have like all these subselects and other kinds of things. So this simple act of pipe forwarding things, basically each pipe forward you think about in SQL is gonna have to be like a nested select. So the whole thing, like it, the more you have in there, like the it just becomes a dumpster fire. I think it's horrible. Um, uh, alerting is something we want built into the language. So the idea here is these are scripts that be running in the background on the platform. We haven't implemented this alert package yet, but this is an idea of what it could look like, right? So we're getting a minute's worth of data, looking at like some work queue measurement in the depth, and we're taking the mean of that, and then we're saying, we're setting warning critical conditions then finally we're saying limit the number of notifications that you would send out. So basically don't send out more than one notification per minute. For those of you who have ever created an alerting script and actually sent yourself like, I don't know, 500,000 emails when something <laughs> went wrong, I hope you will appreciate this. And then we're sending it to Slack. So again, the two functionality is it's not scoped necessarily to InfluxDB or even to another database. It could be to a service like Slack. So that's similar to how things work in Capacitor. We're basically combining the concepts of Capacitor and InfluxDB into one realization, which is Flux. All right, wrapping up. First thing, go get the nightlies. If you go to the download page, there's like a banner at the top that says where you get this. Right now, all this stuff is only in nightly builds. There are three things that you have to use. There's InfluxDB, there's, um, uh, Flux, the actual uh, separate binary that you need to run that hooks up with InfluxDB, and finally there's chronograph for the user interface. You can get the code and you can file issues. And you can file issues whether it's a bug of something you found or if it's feedback that you have for us about the language. We want to hear what people think about the language, what it's like to work with it. Uh, this repo is InfluxData slash platform. It's open source, it's MIT. We want to hear from the community as much as possible. SQL is a great thing, and it's a really powerful tool. But the thing is, it shouldn't be the only tool. We can dare to do better. We can try to create something better. The future of development, I think, is in data-driven applications. There are going to be a mass of new developers whose only job it is to try and gain insight from data and work with data. And with Flux, we want to enable everyone to be a data engineer and let millions of new data engineers bloom out of that. Thank you.
Q&A? Yep, five minutes. I have, uh, you have five minutes for Q&A. I have five minutes for Q&A. What? Oh yeah, it works. Okay, so my question would be: Is the is that make sense to l run the flux on the separate machine, or you always run it on the same machine? Which is 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 there, is there any huge overheads of running it on the same machine? Or? Uh, right now, I'd run it on the same machine. Um, but the I, the I mean, ideally, what you probably do is you containerize it so you can limit its resource utilization. Right. That's the nice thing. One of the, I didn't talk about this in this talk. But one of the goals with Flux was to decouple the query compute from the actual storage so that we could have one, separate scaling properties. We could scale query compute separately from storage, but the other is separate isolation properties. So we could, like our new, our new plat Cloud 2.0 platform is gonna be multi-tenanted, and the way we're gonna do that is basically to, to, to containerize query workloads and limit what people can do so they don't create noisy neighbor problems and all that other stuff. But ultimately, if you don't have to go over the network that's good, but again, one thing I didn't mention is at least for influx, when you do from influx, it will push down some of the logic to the storage tier so that it transfers as little data as possible, right? So if you have aggregates, aggregates that are being computed, it'll compute the summary ticks and just send the summary ticks back up to the query engine so that it doesn't have to pipe all the raw data over the network. So it's almost like a MapReduce that happens on the fly. Hey, where can I go find Flux right now on GitHub? Is it in the? It's in platform. It's in platform. Influx data slash platform, and it's actually slash query is the subdirectory within platform that Flux lives. Perfect. But all the issues are going in there. So does that mean capacitor is gone from the new platform? Are you replacing it completely by allowing direct logic built into the query scripting language? In the 2.0 version of the platform, capacitor as a concept still exists, but as a separate thing. So we're gonna have support for tick script, um, but the idea is in the 2.0 version of the platform, like background processing is a first class citizen where you don't have to actually add a new separate thing and have to deal with it. Perfect, so like that example with alerting, like if I wanna build my own logic on top of the data in influx, I don't need capacitor. Definitely. You do, You wouldn't need capacitor, Okay, no. great, cool. But yeah, but again, like the, we wanna support tick script and all that other stuff. The difference is we're just trying to unify capacitor, actually we're trying to unify chronograph capacitor and influx as one cohesive whole. Got it, okay, thank you. Um, do you provide any um, behind the scenes optimization of um, queries and you get newer people writing stuff maybe in suboptimal ways? Yeah, so optimization is a never ending battle. Uh, and so it's just something we're gonna have to continue to do. Like it, it's like if, if people had functions like uh, you know, two different programmers can write two different ways of doing code and they have wildly different performance properties, right? So. Uh, it's one, of the, and we haven't even begun to try to do optimization. Our goal right now is functionality first and optimize it later, uh, because we want to prove out the, the design of the language itself uh, and the syntax and all that stuff. But yeah, I, I would imagine we will be working on optimi optimization for as long as we're working on Flux, which is hopefully a very long time. <laughs> In the. In Capacitor, you have the UDF uh, option. What uh, it will be in this? Which option? UDF. UDFs. Um, so that that's kind of outside the scope of the language itself. I mean, we will have some sort of similar concept where you'll be able to call out to uh, a, a separate process that's running. We just haven't spec that out fully. But yeah, I mean, we we want to support the UDF functionality. Our ideal is that people wouldn't have to create UDFs. I think the number of UDFs that you would have to create will be significantly less because you'll be able to represent it just in flux the language itself. But there are definitely cases where you would drop down to, to totally custom code and we'll enable that. Cool, it's that's all, that's all my time. I, I'm getting the big hook. Big hook. So thank you everyone. Thanks Paul. Uh, 
um, predict what the question was going to be, but I, none of you asked this question. Uh, where do we get the slides from, and will this talk uh, be uh, available on video? Um, so the answer is in, a, in a, uh, hopefully by Monday of next week. Uh, the slides will be up, as well as all the talks from today. So for those of you that weren't able to frantically make notes from uh, Paul's talk there, they will all be up on, on Monday. Yes? And I do have a nice bag, yeah? Don't steal. Don't steal, okay. Um, the other thing, we, um, this afternoon we'll have Grafana also talking about how they are embedding Flux inside of, inside of the platform, because obviously the way that we get usage is it's got to be in chronograph, yeah, you know, obviously, um, but I, you know, sort of great partner Grafana. I know a lot of you use Grafana, so you know, again, both platforms will have this, and uh, you know, get it off GitHub and start making some issues and comments. I um, thought I had one other thing, but I think that was.